Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the fourth, fourth guest talk of this semester's Perspectives in International Development Seminar Series. Uh, for our first time attendees, I'm Terry Tucker, co-organizer of the series, along with Louise Buck and Ed Mabaya. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's seminar, Professor David Lee, an international professor in both the Charles Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management in the newly organized Department of Global Development, David works at the interface of economic development, agriculture, and the environment. I'm guessing that many of the students attending today have taken or will take Professor Lee's undergraduate course in international trade and finance or his graduate course in natural resources and economic development. Uh, he's applied his expertise to work in over 50 countries across the world often collaborating with researchers and policy specialists in government foundations and international organizations. Today, David and his three collaborators, who he will introduce momentarily, share their work in a talk entitled, Incorporating Stakeholder Input in the Development of Croatia's National Agriculture and Rural Development Strategy, 2020 to 2030. Thank you for joining us and, and welcome to all our speakers. David? Thank you, Terry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see everyone uh, that's uh, signed in today. Um, this uh, seminar was originally scheduled for late March, and then we know what happened in early March. So uh, appreciate the, uh, we appreciate the invitation to, uh, to uh, uh, give the, the, the seminar this semester. Um, I wanted to begin uh, by introducing my uh, colleagues in this work. Uh, I will note that we have four of us, we have four short presentations and uh, we're in four different locations. So hopefully the logistics will work out well. Uh, and one of, our, uh, one of our colleagues is in the airport in Brussels. So uh, that may be a particular challenge, but uh, we'll give it a try. Uh, Philip von der Salen is a consultant with the World Bank's Agriculture and Food Global Practice. He has uh, previous positions with FAO and the Rainforest Alliance. His work focuses on strategy development, research, and project design, specifically in the areas of policy reform, sustainable value chains, food systems, and rural development. Philip has degrees from Ghent University and master's degrees from the Free University of Brussels and the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins. Svetlana Edmeads is a senior agricultural economist at the World Bank. She has extensive project management experience in many countries in Latin America and Eastern Europe, including Croatia, where she's led policy dialogue between the World Bank and the Ministry of Agriculture. She has a PhD in agricultural and natural resource economics from North Carolina State and joined the bank as a young professional after serving as a postdoctoral fellow at IFPRI. Uh, Niksha College is spokesperson for the Ministry of Agriculture of Croatia at the Special Committee on Agriculture in the European Commission in Brussels. Previously, he served as Assistant Minister of Agriculture. He led the agricultural sector dialogue during the Croatian presidency of the European Union earlier this year from January through June when Croatia held the, held the presidency of the EU. He holds a master's in EU studies from the Centre International de Formation European. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, this is just a brief uh, outline. Is that coming through, everyone? Terry? Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, we have uh, basically five uh, short components of this presentation today. Uh, uh, David, it's uh, uh, David. Your screen is not uh, coming through. Uh, right at the bottom of the page, uh, the little green uh, button there that says "Share Screen." At the bottom of your Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Let me try it again. Okay. How about that? It's coming. There we go. Yep. You got. Work? It. Okay. Yep. Shared the wrong screen. Okay. Um, we have short of uh, mini presentations, if you will. Uh, Nick Shetalic will talk about a background to Croatian agriculture and the reform of the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. 
Uh, Svetlana Edmeads will talk a little bit about strategic planning for Croatia and agriculture and the role of stakeholders. Uh, I'll summarize the steps and, and just uh, give snapshots of some of the results of our stakeholder work. Uh, Philip von der Salen will talk about moving or transitioning the stakeholder work to actions and interventions. And the Nikšić College and Svetlana Edmeads will, uh, will close with some, with some summary remarks. Okay, uh, Niksha, you want, Alex, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you, David. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to have this opportunity. Dobar dan svima. Moje ime je Nikšat Kalec. This is uh, me uh, presenting myself in Croatian. Um, as we don't have much time, uh, let me get straight to the point. Um, so, so you will be hearing about the, the work that we've done as the Ministry of Agriculture of Croatia together with the World Bank on uh, designing uh, the national agricultural strategy for the next five to ten years. Now, um, perhaps uh, a bit on, uh, on a, of a background of Croatia would be uh, uh, useful, especially for, for people who don't know much about Basically, one thing you, you should understand is that um, Croatia is a country that's been um, basically in a transition for the last 30 years. Um, and this is perhaps more true for agriculture than, than any other sector. Uh, up until 1990, uh, Croatia was a part of the then former Yugoslavia, which was a socialist country. So. Um, um, sorry, we I think we're having a little bit of problem with hearing it. The microphone is cutting in and out. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, try, try again, Niksha, if you would. Can you hear me? Yes, right there. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess that is the cable thing. I don't know what to do. Uh, just signal me if you don't. And okay. I'll, I'll play with, uh, with the wires. Okay. This, but, um, um, anyways, what I was saying is in uh, this transition that has been an uh, ongoing thing in, in the country started in the 90s when uh, Yugoslavia fell apart. And of course, uh, there was a, a, a transition from the uh, uh, socialist state where uh, all the resources, including the land, obviously were owned and governed by a public bodies into uh, uh, into the, the market economy, right? And uh, well, then as well, there was a, a war that lasted for five, six years. So all, all that period of, of 10 years in the 90s until 2000s, it was a period of transition uh, where Croatia, like all the other ex-socialist, uh, ex-communist countries of the, of the Eastern Europe, um, all took its own models on how to uh, to um, you know transpose from from one system into another. Now, when you when you look at the agriculture, uh, you can see the differences, uh, the different uh, approaches that these countries uh, took. So, for example, um, in in Croatia, you today you have um, um, when you look at the, at the EU uh, average. You have uh, a large share of, of small holders, uh, small landholders, while some other uh, Eastern European countries uh, like Czech Republic or, or Poland or, or Slovakia, Slovakia or Hungary went the other way, and, and most of the land that was previously publicly owned is now in, a, in the hands of, uh, of a large uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, landholder. So anyways, uh, until the, the end of the 90s, until the, the, the turn of the century, we were in this process of uh, um, adapting to the um, uh, market economy and everything that goes with it. And at the same time, simultaneously, um, we started the negotiations with the European Union, which, of course, um, required of the country um, another set of reforms uh, and from one transition another. Now, um, Croatia has been member of the European Union for the last seven years, we entered in 2013, um, and as 
as David said in his introductory remarks, we uh, presided over the European Union in the first half of this year. The EU functions uh, in a way that each six months another member state takes over and, uh, and presides over joint policies, uh, agricultural being one of them. Um, uh, Nick, uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Terry here. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, we're still having uh, quite a lot of time when it's uh, breaking up. I'm wondering uh, whether you have a built-in microphone in your laptop and if, if you turn the volume up, if, if we could simply do it without the, uh, the external microphone, perhaps. We could try that. Um, and if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll go back and do the best we can with, uh, with the corded microphone. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Is it better? Yes. I think it's so. Better. Yeah. Okay. So, um, back to where I was, um, the time of, of the entering of the European Union, uh, 2013, is also a time of a uh, new cycle in in the in the EU world, the EU functions in seven years cycles. Um, basically, every seven years, you, the uh, the Union agrees on the uh, joint budget, the so-called um, multi-annual financial framework, where you, uh, the twenty-seven, well, then twenty-eight, with the UK now twenty-seven decide on besides the the budget also decide on the on the common policies uh, common agricultural policy has from the beginning of the eu been one of the uh, most important of those and uh, one with the uh, highest share of the joint budget now uh, back then in 2013 just like now in 2020 uh, the common agricultural policy was going through um, substantial reform this happens from time to time to all the european policies uh, as luck would have it the common agricultural policy had gone through uh, or is still going currently through uh, uh, two big reforms in the last 10 years uh, this, of course, for Croatia meant that we were trying to align ourselves with the policy that was changing at the time. So um, that transition that I was talking about that started in the 1990s kept on going during the process of the accession and then in the first uh, six or seven years of, uh, of the Croatian membership in the EU. The common agricultural policy of the EU, that's also something that, that you should know uh, when talking about what this topic, uh, is based on two pillars. Uh, what we call two pillars is basically on one hand, you have your direct payments, which um, are, is basically uh, income support to farmers. And on the other hand, you have uh, your rural development, uh, structural investments, which uh, are targeted at achieving uh, whatever goals are uh, currently those that uh, policy stands for. And it's up to each member state to decide how to uh, divide the envelope that the country has between these two pillars. So some countries decide, some member states decide to put more money on the direct payments meaning more uh, direct transfers for their farmers, while the others opt for uh, a more reform-based approach and, uh, and give a larger share to the uh, uh, second, so-called second pillar. I'm talking about this because the current reform, the one that we are still negotiating in the European Council and the European Parliament, uh, is trying to merge these two into a, a one joint policy where both uh, direct payments and the rural development would be um, targeted at achieving certain goals. Currently, uh, the name of the game is uh, the Green Deal. Basically, we are uh, greening our policy and, uh, and, and, and trying to, to set up such rules 
that would guarantee a sustainable production in the years to come. Now, um, at the time when we uh, back home in Zagreb, in Croatia, in the ministry decided that uh, we need a comprehensive strategy uh, to, uh, to, to, to set the course for, uh, for Croatian agriculture in the next decade, uh, we did know that uh, a reform is coming. We did not, however, we did not know what the reform will entail. And uh, it was very interesting to, um, to watch during this process uh, to follow how our work developed in line with uh, what was happening at the, at the EU level. We were in, in, in a, sort, a sort of a pioneers at the, at the EU stage because the, the approach we've taken uh, has uh, later on been very much aligned with uh, what the EU is requiring today from uh, from all the member states meaning um, for example the fact that we uh, did um, a thorough analysis of uh, efficiency and um, and sustainability of the uh, direct payments and their efficacy in in achieving the the goals of the of the policy which uh, as i said up until now was not really something that was done in the Europe. Direct payments were simply too large share, um, were simply transfers for the farmers. You, you sign up your acres and you, you receive the, uh, the amount based on, on what is agreed uh, as, the, as the common framework. Now, with the approach we've taken with the idea that um, all investments in the, uh, in the agriculture um, should contribute to, 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 the, to more goals than just simply uh, um, being a, 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 and, and support the income of the farmers is the, uh, the same or the similar approach which is now taken in the, uh, in the Europe with, uh, with, with the new proposal for the common agricultural policy. Um, another very important element uh, that we've um, and that we've uh, taken or, or another aspect that we've taken in our work and something that is a, a topic of, of the, the today's presentation is uh, is the fact that um, you know typically in Croatia like in many other uh, countries um, you do involve stakeholders in the, um, when when the public uh, when the government is is designing or developing strategies or, or uh, future uh, uh, plans. But typically this happens at the end of the process, right? You've got your ministries or your uh, government agencies developing a um, certain strategy or, or whatever uh, we're talking about. And then once this, um, this document is ripe enough, you involve the public via the uh, public consultations, um, um, you know, you hold uh, seminars, uh, roundtables, and so on. The, the approach we've taken and what you've heard, what you will hear about today uh, in, in a bit more length, is the, uh, the, the approach to, uh, to reach out to the stakeholders at the, at the very start of our, of our process. And this is something that has been um, received uh, very well by, by the public in Croatia, by the farmers and by the, uh, all the stakeholders um, because, you know, uh, the, the, the general feeling among the farmers, farmers are a, are a, a peculiar bunch, uh, let me put it that way, and, uh, and um, generally the feeling towards the, uh, the government and the, uh, the, the ministry itself is not uh, really uh, the one of um, of uh, uh, much confidence in, in what is being done. And especially with this constant uh, transitions we are going through, it is not an easy job for, uh, for a farmer to, uh, to follow what, what, what the requirements are. You know, the, the, for, for, for a farmer today in European Union, uh, using common agricultural policy um, effectively Besides being a farmer, he also needs to be a, a, a manager and uh, an uh, accountant and uh, and many other things 
um, that uh, that would enable him to apply to uh, to to these uh, structural funds. So that uh, approach. Um, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, perhaps I could uh, we could get your reflections uh, at the end. Uh, on the process and uh, perhaps move on to Svetlana right now. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, Svetlana. no problem. Thanks. Thank you, Niksha, and it's a pleasure to uh, participate in this. Thanks to Cornell University for inviting us to share our work. Um, I just uh, wanted to continue on what Niksha was saying in the context that he presented, the Ministry of Agriculture of Croatia reached out to the World Bank uh, to provide advisory support for the formulation of the National um, Agriculture and Rural Development Strategy. Niksha and I actually negotiated this agreement and started the work. Um, in 2018 and are close to completing the different steps. There are four major steps. Um, uh, David, if you would like to, yeah. Uh, four steps um, of, of the work that we proposed. We started with a diagnostic analysis, which is really a whole lot of uh, econometric work that we did. This is where basically the economics were came into play. Um, we wanted to get a very good sense of the baseline, if you like, of um, economic, socioeconomic baseline of the agricultural sec sector of Croatia before we felt that we could meaningfully provide um, any advice. Uh, our uh, research then uh, was to lead into the priority setting um, for the formulation of the strategy. And currently we are working on actual practical implementation of some of these strategic areas that we identified. As from the very beginning, we knew that it's very important to um, uh, try to test things that we think um, are relevant in the strategy. But one point I wanted to make here is, uh, and, and, and an important thing for you to note, is that throughout all these steps, we had uh, uh, stakeholders involved um, as uh, because sort of and, and also we had to consider the fact that qualitative information is very much driven by the priors of the stakeholders um, so to avoid if you like bias there um, uh, in terms of location experience age gender association etc we, um, to ensure basically a sufficient representation of all these elements, um, we did our consultations in different parts of the country. We kept going on road trips basically after each step to make sure that what we are finding out uh, resonates with producers um, and, and then hear their feedback. Um, so the feedback basically from stakeholders came at each step. Next, David. Um, so there are many benefits to meaningfully involve stakeholders in our work. I personally strongly believe in the role of uh, stakeholders. Um, and here I say meaning, meaningfully um, to highlight the importance of listening to those on the ground and using this information to guide policy. Um, often, um, you know, uh, we, or in the context of the EU even, you know, stakeholder consultations are required and, and, and many approach them as basically a tick in the box. We, from the very beginning, considered stakeholder participation as the bottom-up approach that we, we will follow to formulate the strategy. Um, an important element here is um, also the coordination with the ministry and local authorities. We couldn't just go and talk to producers. Um, they had to be engaged as well because they form, um, they're part of the, uh, the stakeholder group, if you like. So their support and participation was critical in reaching out to producers and the diverse group of stakeholders and bringing everybody to the debate. And some of these debates were quite heated. Um, the whole team was there and we could listen a lot. We see the passion and the strong feelings, but for us, it was important to note all this and, 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 and turn this information uh, into a policy advice. Next, David. Um, so um, the challenge, uh, like I said, you know, listening, uh, uh, meaningfully involving stakeholders is important, but the challenge is how to actually do this. 
um, how to um, meaningfully engage a wide range of diverse actors. And to do that, we, um, we basically need a sound methodological approach. Um, we, we decided to combine two approaches, um, a theory of change and a multi-criteria priority setting approach. Um, and uh, we combined these two and ensured that stakeholder participation informed all levels of the results chain. Um, we borrowed the priority setting methodology uh, from work that Professor Lee and I um, and other colleagues did in Latin America years back and then was subsequently also used in the Middle East. Thank you, David. Um, in Latin America, we applied and validated the methodology, uh, the priority setting methodology across three very different agroclimatic regions. We worked with temperate flatlands of Uruguay with commercial ag uh, where commercial agriculture predominates. Uh, we then also considered the highlands of Peru, mostly the subsistence producers type agriculture. And we went to the arid regions of northern Mexico, where we have the large-scale commercial, commercial agriculture. So very different, both agroclimatic regions and also the set of stake, stakeholders and producers were very different. And, um, and our methodology worked very well there. Um, we published it in a peer-reviewed journal. And we subsequently took it to Croatia. First, we... Uh, the ministry was reluctant to sort of try to apply the methodology, but then I think we all um, agreed that it's it's a good thing to to try and 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 uh, and 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 see how it works, and it really yielded very good results. And I will leave you um, here with an anecdote from one of these consultations, um, as it really kind of makes you think of the the, the relevance of of what people think on the ground to our work. In northern Mexico, we showed all these amazing pictures and maps and uh, analysis on the impact of climate change on the region. And we as a team thought that we we're really articulating things very well until this older producer raised his hand and asked a simple question. He basically said to us, well, excuse me, but what does four degrees Celsius increase of temperature mean to my pocket, mean to me? So this is where we all started thinking, okay, how do you explain this to a farmer, you know, directly? So I'll leave you with this and um, thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, I'm going to just give a very uh, brief, uh, I apologize for the brevity. I'm just going to go through a number of uh, slides very quickly on the actual results and the steps of what we did. Uh, we, there's basically five steps involved here. I'm, again, just going to give you a one, one shot on each and try to explain our approach. Um, Svetlana mentioned the sector diagnostic that we, that we did, a very comprehensive diagnostic study of the entire, uh, the entire sector involving a lot of data analysis, review of past research, interviews, meetings with diverse stakeholders all over the country from both pub public and private sectors. Um, we did a, a lot of original, uh, uh, both applied research, original research in particular areas, about a dozen particular areas reflecting the uh, relationship of Croatia to the CAP, a common agricultural policy, the efficiency and equity of, of public spending, the subsidy intensity of farm incomes, economic linkages, uh, agroecological and climate aspects of Croatian agriculture and so forth. Uh, and the upshot of all of that work, the sector diagnostic was a very comprehensive study, but part of that was to identify the, basically the key challenges facing Croatia's agricultural sector. And we ended up with these 14 challenges. You could call them objectives or goals. Uh, we're rephrasing them as challenges. I'm not going to go through them in the interest of time, but you can see them. They're, they're largely self-explanatory. Based on that uh, sector diagnostic, we then did a national survey of Croatian uh, agricultural stakeholders to help prioritize those challenges facing the sector. Now, one of the interesting things about this entire approach is remember now that we're dealing with a sector that has more than 200,000 
uh, participants, 200,000 or more people involved in the sector, either as farmers, food processing, food dis distribution, or, or other parts of the sector. How do you take, the, the real challenge here is how do you take a potentially enormous diversity of views and number of views and distill them, incorporate them in a strategic planning process that, that is efficient, that makes sense, that, that reflects the, the input from those stakeholders, but also is, is, uh, is operational, is something you can actually use in strategic planning. So we had the sector diagnostic, we have this national survey, this gives us more information about what those 14 uh, priority challenges and associated response options, how they're viewed by the sector stakeholders. And you can see I've highlighted the top five. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go into them, they're, they're largely self-explanatory. I think the key take home message here is that by and large they, uh, Stakeholders are prioritizing the economic impact, productivity enhancement, economic growth and employment, those types of objectives and challenges. Uh, another interesting one is number five, promoting interest in food sector opportunities among youth. And this reflects the fact that, that Eastern Croatia over the last, uh, the last 20 years has had a movement of a migration of many young people out, either out of the country or to the coast, where there's a, as many of you may know, there's a very, there's a burgeoning uh, uh, tourism industry. And so uh, there's a lot of interest in what, given the fact that there's excess labor demand in the eastern part of the country, how to offset that in, imbalance. Then the third step was stakeholder consultations. Svetlana re referred to these. These were actual workshop-based stakeholder consultations uh, with uh, stakeholders around the country. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different methodologies. One can use formal methodologies for priority setting. I just mentioned them here. Uh, we elected to use scoring methods based on our previous work and similar uh, types of uh, efforts that, that Svetlana mentioned. Um, what does that actually mean? Again, a snapshot view. First, it means consolidating the information we previously had from the sector diagnostic and from the survey into nine uh, key challenges and associated response options. We want our stakeholders in a workshop setting to evaluate those and rank them or prioritize them, but they have to do so against a set, a set of criteria. Right? You have, it's more effective if you're evaluating options against specific criteria. In the case of Croatia, it's a relatively simple matter because we have from the common agricultural policy in the current round of policy reform, we have specific objectives that have been stated by the EU, by the CAP, and they are these nine. Three objectives having to do with economic growth and productivity enhancement, three objectives having to do with climate change and environmental uh, considerations, and three objectives relating to uh, rural development. And so we have these criteria essentially given to us, which we used, and in the stakeholder workshop, uh, uh, workshops we held, we first asked our stakeholders that were there, our respondents, to actually weight these criteria and what I'm showing you here is a weighting of those nine different criteria. And again, you can see the ones that are highlighted in red are generally the economic related criteria that are, that are given uh, primary emphasis by, by stakeholders. So with those criteria then in the second stage of this, of this uh, step three, we then ask those stakeholders to, to score or to uh, prioritize amongst those nine and we ask in a matrix format them to evaluate each one of those against each of the criteria. And so what you end up with is a weighted a score for each of the challenges and response option sets. And as you can see, by and large, uh, similar to the, the results of our previous uh, uh, exercises, our previous efforts, it's the economic criteria that are weighted most, most heavily. In interestingly, these are the ones uh, highlighted in red, Interestingly, the top rated uh, by stakeholders of these sets of challenges and response options was the transfer of knowledge, information, and technology to producers and agribusiness, 
which is interesting in the sense that uh, worldwide, perhaps, and certainly in rural Croatia, it's generally acknowledged that it's knowledge, information, and technology development that's going to be the at the root of a much of the future success of, of the agricultural sector. So with these different three different inputs then, the diagnostic study, this national survey, and the formal priority setting uh, processes that we went through, we then consolidate that input into a number of different uh, foci here. Here you can see the six that are listed here. Uh, enhancing competitiveness, strengthening rural economic development, transferring knowledge, information, and technology, using uh, productively mobilizing state and private agricultural land, strengthening the broader enabling environment and the business, uh, the business environment, and increasing on and off farm diversification as the final uh, sets of priorities that emerge from the stakeholder process. Then the final step is to how is how to transpose or interpret those priorities and that stakeholder input into the final uh, proposed actions and interventions as part of the strategic planning process. And for that, I'm going to turn to Philip van der Stalen, who will uh, present this final part of our presentation. Thank you, uh, David, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, today. I'll be presenting to you how we uh, went about using the, the different inputs from stakeholders to formulate first uh, strategic objectives that represent the government's policy priorities for the agri-food sector. And then secondly, a roadmap to achieving uh, those objectives. Next slide, please. I'm gonna start with the way in which we formulated the objectives uh, of the strategy first. The most important thing we, uh, we had to bear in mind here was that these objectives should help the government tell a coherent and convincing story about how the strategic priorities reflected in the objectives. First of all, align with the challenges uh, prioritized by stakeholders and how they will contribute to the broader vision for the, uh, for the sector. To make sure the story adds up, we applied a number of considerations or filters, uh, if you will, to the onboarding of stakeholder inputs. First of all, we have to make sure that there are no contradictions between the objectives and the broader vision so that each policy priority would indeed be uh, instrumental to realizing the vision. We had to make sure that the government could speak about its policy priorities as they relate to different parts of the agri-food system because this would help different stakeholders better understand the priorities with respect to the specific part of the agri-food system where that stakeholder uh, may find him or, uh, or herself. We also had to consider the possible effects of each objective on the other objectives so that we would maximize synergies and establish a, a strategic agenda that's more than just the, the sum of the, the parts. And finally, we had to try to limit the number uh, of objectives and use language that is simple, that sets a clear policy direction and inspires action. The key to limiting uh, the number of objectives was our use of the, the theory of change methodology because it forced us, um, first of all, to, to clearly distinguish between challenges, their long-term effects, and the underlying drivers or causes of each uh, challenge. This methodology also forced us to think clearly about the causal relationships between the challenges, the underlying causes, and the long-term effects. And as a result, the approach uh, enabled us to spot areas where different challenges we had identified and prioritized with stakeholders uh, intersect and which we could then consider combining under a different uh, banner. And I'll illustrate later what exactly this all means with an example. Now, by applying the different filters I, I, I outlined, the strategic priorities we, uh, we ended up proposing were ultimately structured around four strategic objectives, one of which explicitly uh, cut across the, uh, the others. In the interest of time, I will not go into the specifics of each objective, but there are a few things I would like to draw your uh, attention to in light of the filters I uh, described earlier. First is how each objective speaks to the different uh, stakeholders in different parts of the agri-food system. When you look at objective one, you will see that it speaks to the reality of agri Croatia's uh, agricultural producers on farm and for which the National uh, Stakeholder Survey elevated the challenge of increasing productivity as a high priority. Objective two 
speaks to the reality of the broader agri-food chain off or downstream the farm and for which the National Stakeholder Survey elevated Croatia's weak business environment as the top priority given the high transaction costs it imposes and thus weakens the competitiveness of various stakeholders across the agri-food system. Objective three speaks to the reality of the rural economy and rural populations for which the stakeholder workshops prioritize the challenge to attract more investment, jobs, and, and youth in order to better clarify the policy direction in the objective and inspire action, we actually decided to reframe the challenge more as an opportunity to renew the rural economy, which remains uh, overly dependent on primary agriculture in, uh, in Croatia. And finally, objective four speaks to the reality of Croatia's agricultural knowledge and innovation system. The uh, dysfunctions in this system that uh, limit the levels of innovation among producers and agribusinesses were elevated as the top priority in the stakeholder uh, workshops. Now, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to give you an example. Just go one, go back just one more. Yeah. Wanted to give you an example of how we combine certain challenges that intersect to reduce the number of objectives. The reference to climate resilience in, in objective one is such an example as it combines the challenges related to improving natural resource management and managing climate risks, which we had identified before. Um, important to point out here as well is that even though uh, these challenges did not necessarily raise to the very top of sec uh, sector stakeholders' priorities, they were retained here as a strategic priority in light of the policy mandates and related targets included in the new sustainable development strategies and initiatives launched at the level of the EU, in particular the, uh, the Green Deal. We'll get back to this issue of policy mandates in a minute. Next slide, please. Now, after we formulated the strategic objectives, our next task was to develop a roadmap for achieving the objectives through a series of specific uh, interventions. During each round of stakeholder consultations, we solicited inputs regarding possible interventions, we call them response options, to address the root causes of the key challenges we had identified. And the reason for this is that we wanted to take advantage of each outreach effort to collect as many ideas as possible regarding potential solutions. And we cannot properly assess a certain challenge without simultaneously considering potential ways forward. Now that said, of course, some solutions will be more appropriate and viable uh, than others. So similar to the development of the strategic objectives, we applied a number of filters to the incorporation of stakeholder inputs regarding the proposed interventions. Specifically, we consider whether the intervention logic is sound, meaning does the chain of results produced by the intervention actually connect to one or more objectives? Secondly, how much leverage does the intervention have, meaning how effective and cost efficient would the intervention be in changing the behavior of different players in the agri-food system? And here, we very much relied on the results of our uh, diagnostic work. Thirdly, how innovative is the intervention? Does it represent rather incremental change or does it help the sector break entirely new ground? Good strategies should strike a balance between the two. Next, where is the money gonna come from? Which institution will lead the implementation and does that institution have a clear national or international mandate to implement the initiative? And can the implementation of the initiative start in relatively short order? Last but not least, is the political will and energy there to move the intervention forward. And I'd say this last filter is the most difficult to apply as local political dynamics are always in flux and not always uh, transparent to, uh, to outsiders. Next slide. So the roadmap we uh, proposed was organized around six actions, each of which contributed to at least one uh, strategic objective as you can, uh, can see here. Next slide. Each of the uh, actions listed to your, uh, to your left that we included in the roadmap consist of a subset of specific interventions that are closely related. The idea here is that by joining and closely coordinating related interventions as part of a broader action, they will contribute more effectively towards an objective than if they were undertaken in isolation. The specific interventions listed here correspond with the response options for the key challenges we had identified and continuously developed with stakeholder inputs. And the ones listed here are those that were retained after applying the different filters described earlier. As part of this uh, filtering uh, process, we looked closely at the different relationships between the proposed interventions and objectives 
in order to identify subsets of interventions that are closely related and that can then be grouped together under a broader action, which is basically a banner, a banner statement that summarizes a key component or strand of the roadmap, and as such, it, it should facilitate the external communications around the roadmap. Important to highlight here is that most of the interventions included in the roadmap will be fundable under the CAP and other EU support uh, programs. Several interventions here are therefore closely aligned with specific support measures and requirements included in those uh, EU programs. Intervention B1 is a case in point here. Uh, under the latest CAP proposals, reform proposals, EU member states will be mandated to include so-called eco-schemes in their future sector programs, which are basically payment for ecosystem services and mechanisms. We therefore had to make sure to include a specific uh, intervention in the roadmap, B1, that describes how the Croatian government intends to go about the design of such uh, reward mechanisms. Another example is intervention E2, regarding the development of a national circular bioeconomy plan, which is a precondition for accessing EU innovation funds supporting the development of the, the circular economy, which is a policy area around which there's significant political energy and interest at the level of the Croatian government. As for interventions in the roadmap that the government can implement without any EU mandate or, or funding, I wanna say that those tend to be the ones most contingent on local political uh, dynamics and whose viability are therefore a bit more difficult to assess as, as an outsider. And interventions D1 and D2, which relate to core regulatory and taxation functions of the government in politically charged sensitive areas, such as agricultural land, including state owned land, are examples of more national uh, interventions where we had to calibrate carefully stakeholder inputs with the local uh, political context. And I'll stop here. I hope this gives you a sense of both the methodology and the different considerations we applied for a stakeholder driven and evidence based development of the, uh, the national strategy. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have later on. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, we've uh, almost, almost uh, running out of time here, but I would like to ask uh, Svetlana and Niksha, maybe if you could each just take one, one or two minutes uh, to, to wrap up uh, with any closing uh, comments. We've obviously gone over a lot of material here uh, in fairly short order, but do you have any, uh, any final uh, conclusions or things you'd like to share? Just maybe one, one or two minutes each. Thank you. Okay. Niksha? Um, oh, Niksha or I? Which yeah, one? Yeah, either. Okay. I'll yeah, just... Okay, thank you, Niksha. Um, so I just wanted to uh, stress the fact that, I mean, the process uh, for turning stakeholder opinion into policy and national strategy is very complex. And the methodology we presented is just a tool. And each tool needs to be used wisely. So sort of the takeaway messages for me have always been that um, it's important to know who, who you engage. And in a sense, you have to always engage a diverse set of stakeholders, you know, women, youth, and think of the scope of the work. Is it national, regional? And basically, um, the stakeholder group has to be representative of those areas. Um, focus also um, on bottom-up approaches to ensure the transparency, accountability, and the buy-in. And in terms of the relevance of this work as we go forward, um, as each country now under the CAP reform process has to formulate the strategic plans, we see in many of the EU countries the stakeholder process is basically still just a tick in the box. So we strongly believe that what we've done in Croatia um, really does bring a different approach to um, engaging stakeholders and really valuing and including their opinion into the um, uh, formulation of the strategic plans for agriculture of each country. So with this, I pass it, pass it to you, Niksha. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, I've been uh, reminded by a kind officer here that I have to wear the mask, so uh, I'll try it out because of all the problems we've had with with, uh, with audio. But if I get arrested, I'll, I'll send the bill to uh, to the university. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll build uh, further. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to build a bit further on, on what Svetlana said. Um, the uh, the stakeholders. 
I don't think there is another sector, maybe I'm wrong, but as, as far as I know, there isn't another sector in, uh, in our uh, modern society which has such a diverse group of people involved in it and still being uh, uh, members or, or, or stakeholders in, a, in, a, in the same sector. Um, in that sense, um, getting these people together in one country and, and let alone at the, at, the, at the level of the, of the EU27, getting these people together and finding a, a common uh, solutions and, and the goals that we could uh, all stand behind jointly is, uh, is as you can imagine, um, quite a task. And we've run through it now in, in five minutes, but uh, we've, uh, we've been working on this for, uh, for two and, and, uh, years and, and, and a few months extensively. Uh, Svetlana said visiting all the, uh, the, the regions in Croatia because Croatia, although being a tiny uh, country, is, uh, is a very um, diverse in, in terms of the climate and, uh, and what goes with it, obviously, the, uh, the agricultural production. So, um, so finding these uh, um, goals that the stakeholders would uh, share with the, uh, with, with the government um, and, and making a, a prioritizing amongst them was a, was a really difficult part of, I, I would say, uh, our, our whole uh, task. And, and David and, and Philip here, they were actually in charge of, of, of that part of our, of our work. And I remember long meetings we've had trying to figure out how to um, restructure these priorities because another element that I wanted to, uh, to touch upon and, and, and I will close with this is the fact that, which I'm very proud of by the way, is, uh, is the fact that um, the, the, the CAP reform um, is, is basically a, a top-down approach. There is the, uh, the, the list of priorities that the EU has agreed upon and they are now being trickled down through different policies and into different member states and regions and so on. What we've done is, uh, is uh, something completely different. We've started with identifying uh, what is needed on the ground and then building on it and trying to find the policy solutions that would then be aligned with these needs. And as luck would have it, in the end, you know, we managed to align those with the, uh, the priorities of the CAP the nine priorities that, that Philip showed in, in, in one of his slides. But for me, the most important thing was that we, um, you know, allowed the, uh, the, the, the farmers to be heard and then uh, managed to transpose their needs and their wishes into uh, something that ultimately the EU will be uh, willing to pay for. So let me, let me close with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Niksha, and thank you for negotiating the uh, Brussels airport there so effectively. I hope, uh, hope you survive. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we, we seem to have run out of time, but I, I know uh, from what Terry Tucker said that uh, some of you are, in, quite, in fact, uh, almost all of you are sticking around here. So I, I see quite a few questions in chat, and I'd like to just at least cover two of them. Uh, there are several questions on the climate, the, the changing climate, the, the, the physical climate in, um, in Croatia, and uh, what climate change portends for Croatia and, and how to address it. Uh, Niksha, would you like to talk about that, or Svetlana? Sure, I can say a few words. Uh, I've, I've been also uh, um, with one eye checking, uh, checking the questions. I see somebody asked how come the climate was at the bottom of the list. And you know, this is um, in Croatia. The climate change is perhaps not as visible, and in, as in some other uh, countries and regions around the world, um, we do uh, have summers that are getting increasingly warmer. But uh, so far, you know, it's been a, a bit of a, a blessing. The weather has always been nice on the Croatian coast, but now we have summers that last four months instead of uh, three. Mm, but in, in terms of the agri-production, um, I wouldn't say that the, uh, the effects are yet so visible that they would be the uh, first thing that comes to a farmer's mind when you talk about the, uh, the priorities we have. So that's why you always see the economic 
uh, uh, challenges uh, at the top of their priority list. And that's then what we had to do to balance the two and, and to try to align with uh, the direction the, the whole EU is going. Uh, we do have uh, an increasing number of, um, of uh, uh, um, bad weather conditions like uh, hailstorms during the, the winter, um, floodings and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, following what's going on in other uh, uh, parts of the world, um, I'd say uh, Mediterranean has so far, um, you know, been in, uh, in a good position. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's also uh, another... David, uh, David yes. I just wanted to add, um, I mean, uh, climate is one of those topics that, like Nick just said, because it's not as strongly felt um, by many as in other parts of the world, it's almost seems a bit of uh, an imposition, if you like, in, in the policy arena in Croatia. But I do have to say that uh, as part of the consultations and our work, if you look at the, the first objective of the strategy of Croatia, resilience is a word that has been included. So uh, uh, climate is integrated and to work a little more on that, one of the pilots, uh, the fourth step of our approach, one of the pilots is on agroecological zonification. So we are bringing together soil maps, um, <laughs> climate uh, maps, etc., to better understand the different suitability in, the, in, the, uh, in parts of Croatia to uh, improving productivity. So climate is internalized. It's just not as explicit as probably some of the students may want to see it. Okay, thank you, Svetlana. Uh, maybe we can take one more. I realize uh, some of the students who are still tuned in, if you do have to leave for your next class, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we'll continue a couple of minutes. There's another uh, set of questions, a couple of questions that relate to monitoring and evaluation. Uh, either Svetlana or Philip, would one of you like to talk about M&E and, &E and what, uh, how that fits into the broad picture here? I can take that, um, that uh, question. Um, I think the main point I would, um, I would wanna uh, stress here is that uh, an ME framework should follow the uh, strategic um, framework, not the uh, not the other way around. Um, meaning, um, in the case of the EU, there's a long list of uh, of, of standard indicators to be uh, to be applied in the agri-food sector by all the uh, the EU member states. Uh, however, um, some sets of indicators will be more relevant uh, in, in in one country uh, than others. The only way to determine uh, which indicators are most relevant uh, to a given uh, a given country is to go through the kind of exercise that we have uh, that we have undertaken. It's the only way in which you can uh, put in place uh, a monitoring and evaluation framework that is relevant and that tracks the uh, the right uh, elements, the right things uh, in uh, in light of the uh, the objectives that have been uh, have been set. That's a, sort of a main. Uh, point I'd like to uh, to get across here. I'm not sure, Svetlana, whether there's anything you'd like to uh, to add. I have um, a lot to say about monitoring and evaluation. Um, so I guess, uh, David, we can have an in-person uh, <laughs> uh, conference on this uh, when coronavirus is over, perhaps, uh, as another, um, you know, we can share a lot of our approaches on M&E from Croatia, but also now as we work in Greece. So um, that could be something we follow up on. Okay, thank you. Um, I see we are, uh, there are uh, a few questions left, but I see that uh, our, uh, our participation is slipping as people uh, move either to take cl other classes or to teach other classes. So I think we should probably wrap things up. Uh, Terry, did you have any final remarks? Let, okay, let, let me just uh, uh, thank the entire group for being with us today. It was a great presentation. I can see from the questions and comments uh, on the chat box, uh, uh, you've stimulated uh, some conversations that will extend uh, uh, beyond this hour we've spent together. And, uh, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, with your permission, we'll we'll post the PowerPoint uh, presentation on our course uh, 
uh, Canvas site so people can go back to that and uh, look in a, a bit more detail and with more time at some of the, the points you made. So thanks very much for being with us. Thank and you. Thank you, Terry and uh, David, for giving us the space to uh, present our work. Very much appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you all, and thank you for joining us, uh, Miksha, from the Brussels airport. Appreciate that very much. No problem. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank, Svetlana, thank you. Bye now. <laughs>